to help pay off federal student loans for tens of millions of American borrowers seeking an election year boost by returning to a 2020 campaign promise that was blocked by the Supreme Court last year. And the full force of the moon's shadow crossed the United States today as the first total solar eclipse in seven years plunged the day into darkness and reminded all in its path of our planet's place in the cosmos. And Jonathan Majors, a rising movie star who was found guilty last year of assaulting and harassing his then girlfriend, Grace Jabari, was sentenced in Manhattan criminal courts today to 52 weeks of domestic violence. Now, this is uh, going to take place in Los Angeles, and the star, Jonathan Majors, will avoid the one-year jail time that was associated with his conviction. Also in court today, Donald Trump said in a video statement, uh, well, Donald Trump is in court today seeking to have a Manhattan criminal trial that's set to begin on April 15th delayed. That trial, which uh, is about falsifying records to cover up a sex scandal, uh, Trump is trying to get that trial along with his other trials delayed until after the November election. Trump also said in a video statement today that abortion rights should be left up to the state. Remarks that came after months of mixed signals and mixed statements on an issue that he and his advisors have worried could cost him dearly in the election. Well, there's been a swift response to that statement. Former Vice President Mike Pence delivered a scathing rebuke to Trump's announcement regarding abortion and leaving it up to the states. Uh, Pence said in no uncertain terms that this was a slap in the face to the anti-abortion voters who supported Donald Trump in 2016 and 2020. And the Israeli military's departure from southern Gaza over the weekend has left the territory without a major battlefield for the first time since a brief truce with Hamas in November. This is raising hopes that the two sides might reach another ceasefire. And we've got to give it up to Don Staley. Yes, the coach of the South Carolina's women's basketball team, bested Iowa's uh, star-studded team, including uh, the number one draft pick. And coach Don Staley was overcome with emotion and tears after the win. She's gone on to talk about what it meant to have a team that was undefeated for the entire year. And she also talked about hoping that this win will open doors for women in basketball. And she wants her players to be able to earn enough so that they can create generational wealth. Way to go, Don Staley. This is the news of the day. And this is Ariva Martin in real time. And I'm your host, Ariva Martin. This is your one-stop destination for today's trendy news, expert analysis, and my unfiltered opinions. In this hour, I'm joined by two of my favorite contributors, Dr. Hassan Jeffries. He's a professor of history at Ohio State University and Dr. Carlos Hill, who is an author and professor at the University of Oklahoma. And in hour two, you know what we do. That's the hour where we go deep, where we dig behind those headlines and bring you those stories that people are talking about. Today in hour two, we're going to be talking to criminologist, a uh, professor at the University of California, Irvine, about what's going on uh, regarding crime and crime statistics. We are hearing a lot about crime being at an all time low, but yet there have been some horrific stories of violence that have been amplified on social media and in the news. And when you look at the stats that say crime is going down and you juxtapose that with these stories that have been amplified in the news, uh, what you're seeing across the country, particularly in some red states, is a rolling back of the police reform efforts that we saw after George Floyd was murdered in May of 2020, including in places like Memphis, Tennessee, uh, despite the horrific police beating of Tyree Nichols that we all got to witness because of body cam video, uh, Memphis uh, was going to implement a piece of legislation or an ordinance that would have uh, well, the state of, of Tennessee, I should say, was going to implement an ordinance that uh, would have uh, basically been uh, part of criminal justice reform efforts that we've seen around the country. But the Republican-led legislature in Tennessee had different thoughts. And a bill that was literally going to be named after Tyree Nichols uh, is not likely to pass and has already been defeated, I should say, in the Tennessee 
legislature and around the country, red states are not uh, looking at those declining crime stats. Rather, they are looking at these amplified stories on social media and are doing things, uh, or using those stories, I should say, to justify efforts to roll back criminal justice reform. Uh, so now we're, we're going to talk about where does this leave us, particularly those who, uh, like me, voted for progressive district attorneys uh, and those of us who have been on the front lines calling for criminal justice reform. Is this now going to be elusive, particularly in this election year where Republicans are using these horrific crime stories, as, as few as they may be, uh, as a way to scare voters and to create controversy over crime? So make sure you stick around for hour two. But before I bring on my guests, here's what I'm thinking in real time. Now, it's been a while since I've uh, seen a change.org petition get a lot of traction, but there has been a petition launched to cancel the upcoming Netflix release of Good Times. You all remember Good Times from the 70s? Well, the streaming giant's animated reboot of the beloved 70s sitcom, uh, for a number of reasons, has sent the internet into a uh, just a tizzy. Uh, and many folks are concerned that, well, many of the folks who are working on the reboot of Good Times are concerned about what all of the backlash on social media may do for the April 12th debut of this reboot. Now, this animated series on Netflix, uh, according to the petition, is a glorified stereotypical show that has damaged the image of the original Good Time show that started in 1974 and lasted through 79. Now, the Good Times animated series, according to lots of folks who've uh, seen the trailer, promotes violence, culture destruction of the black community and alcohol abuse. Uh, folks are saying things like it's time to put a stop to this nonsense that is portraying black Americans in a negative light. Now, 2,600 signatures have already been gathered on this petition and the goal was to reach 5,000. So clearly they are halfway there, or more than halfway there. And people are taking uh, or making statements about the reboot based on the show's trailer. And if you've seen the trailer, I agree that trailer is a stereotype field hot mess. Yes, I'll say it again. That trailer is a hot mess. Now, this new show was executive produced by Norman Lear, who uh, was a television legend. He developed the original Good Times and he died uh, at the end of December, in December of 2023. Uh, the original character, J.J. Evans, as we know, played in Good Times by Jimmy Walker was famous for his catchphrase of dynamite. Uh, and this show, this 1970s sitcom was so important because it was the first presentation of a black two parent family in a TV sitcom. Seems unbelievable. But yes, before 1974 and Good Times debuted, there were no sitcoms that showed a black family with a mother, a father, and kids all living together. Now, Netflix is building the new series as a quote unquote spiritual sequel to the live action original. Now, the animated Good Times centers around the fourth generation of the Evans family. And in the reboot, this fourth generation family is living in an apartment, apartment 17C in Chicago, and they are also living in a housing project, uh, as were the original's family members in the original show. Uh, in the show's press material, Netflix tries to make the point that Norman Lear was involved behind the scenes before his death and that he actually makes a cameo appearance in episode eight. Uh, the showrunner coming to the defense of all of the, the backlash, coming to the defense of this reboot, reboot uh, has said what you'll get from the reboot is a lot of social commentary, a lot of pushing the boundaries, she says, a lot of feel good television. And she also says this reboot is more in the vein of The Simpsons and South Park and Family Guy. And if you watch any of the, those shows, you know, they're quite irreverent. And she says that's what they're doing with this reboot of Good Times. 
But check out some of the comments that have been left on the trailer, the YouTube trailer. So if you want to see the trailer, you can go to YouTube and check it out. Some of the comments are, uh, dear black celebrities, it's okay to turn down certain work, especially if your dignity and integrity is at stake. They say this ain't the work you should be doing. Uh, someone else wrote, uh, stereotype theater presents good times. The reboot nobody was asking for. Another comment says, this is absolutely disgusting. Netflix should be ashamed and embarrassed for this. Now, again, check out some of the comments on the change.org uh, petition as well. Uh, that Some of those comments say, this is an obvious attack on the Black family. The show makes a mockery of what the original Good Times was about. It glorifies uh, the degenerate, destructive behavior some in our community engage in and tries to portray this as normal behavior. They say this is unacceptable. Uh, folks who started this, this change.org petition said they will not be watching uh, and will tell everyone they know as well not to watch the reboot. Now, here's the deal. No one is going to force anyone to watch this show. Uh, but I think these producers and even these black celebrities who are a part of the show underestimated, really, really, really underestimated the importance of good times to black culture. I think they underestimated what the backlash that they would be, uh, the backlash that would be. I don't know who thought it was a good idea to have a baby uh, as a drug dealer, which you see on the trailer, there's, you know, a part of this fourth generation family has a baby. Yes, a baby who's a drug dealer. That's in the trailer. Uh, you know, I, some folks think they were just trying to use the good, uh, you know, use the Good Times name as a way to cause people to be nostalgic and maybe to open the door uh, to get viewers. But uh, it's it's gotten up avalanche of bad, bad press, and it hasn't even debuted. I'm going to talk to my contributors about what they think of the reboot of Good Times. Stay with us. More to come right here on KBLA Talk 1580. You're listening to Ariva Martin in real time on KBLA Talk 1580. J.P. Morgan Chase is building on the investments in California to help close the racial wealth gap and build a more equitable future. Visit jpmorganchase.com slash racial equity and get the tools to help reach your financial goals. Are you wet shaving? You'll get razor bumps. Nah, Pop, I'm good with Gillette Skin Guard. How long you been growing that beard? Mama hates anyway. <laughs> Since 77, I shaved and got ingrown so bad. That's why I use the Gillette Skin Guard Razor, Face Scrub, Shave Gel, and Moisturizer. So I don't have to worry about new razor bumps or shaving irritation. Gillette Skin Guard, huh? <laughs> Your mama's going to love this one. <laughs> <laughs> the best a man can get keeps getting better with Gillette Skin Guard. Buy now at a retailer near the you. The thing no one tells you about periods is that your flow changes every day and so should your tampon size. Tampax has five absorbencies to match your changing flow. If it hurts to remove, go down a size. If it leaks, go up a size. Only Tampax has a leak guard braid to help give you up to 100% leak and odor-free protection. All day comfort and protection for under $5 a month. Based on average U.S. consumer usage at manufacturer's suggested price. However, pricing is at the sole discretion of the retailer. Excludes a count. KBLA Talk 1580. We've got a lot to talk about. KBLA Talk 1580, connecting you with services and solutions. Single Moms Planet is a nonprofit organization dedicated to uplifting under-resourced single mom business owners and working mothers nationwide. Single Moms Planet offers comprehensive programs of financial literacy, business development, mentorship, and entrepreneurial training. They provide education, accountability, and hope. Single Moms Planet was founded by model, TV personality, and producer Nefertiri Plessy. Nefertiri felt firsthand the challenges that faced single moms as she was raised by a working single mother. She learned that the most disadvantaged group in the United States are single mom families. According to the U.S. Census, 30% live under the poverty line. So she decided to do something about it, along with co-founder Cole Patterson. Their goal is to end the poverty cycle in single mother households through education, opportunity, and networking, providing family and child enrichment programs for under-resourced single parent families. 
Single Moms Planet serves over 10,000 single moms and their children each year. Studies show that business development and financial literacy provide a positive environment for children and families, exposing them to new possibilities and opportunities. To attend one of their fun events, make a donation, or get more information, or if you need help as a single mom, please visit singlemomsplanet.org. That's singlemomsplanet.org. This is a community call to action from KBLA Talk 1580. We are back and in this hour, I am joined by Dr. Carlos Hill and Dr. Hassan Jeffries. Thanks to both of you for joining me again today. Okay, Dr. Hill, this reboot of Good Times, this trailer is a hot mess. And folks online, Black Twitter in particular, are not having it. They are not here for this reboot. Now, I've been reading some of the comments from the original actors that played in Good Times, as well as from some of the uh, you know new folks that have been cast or who are voices are going to be used in this animated series. What are you thinking about this reboot? You know, I'm thinking about, Ariva, how do we get here? How do we really get here? I've come to see Netflix as a place where I can get Black content, authentic Black content, Black content that um, is respectful of Black people, Black culture. During Black History Month, for many, several years, I've been able to go and find great um, content, not only entertaining content, but content that affirms Black people. And so this catches me off guard because I've been used to, I've been accustomed to not having this conversation about Netflix, but this feels to me like a departure. Maybe the company is going in a different direction. Um, and it makes me feel, Ariva, like the conversations we've been having about why DEI and higher education and corporate America are so important. I can't see a group of Black people around the table and them saying, this is a good idea. We should go forward. We should green light this racism as entertainment, right? I can't see that. But maybe, just maybe, maybe Dr. Jeffrey's got a different idea, but I th I can't see a group of Black people, educated Black people around the table at Netflix saying, this is a good idea. We should we should green like this and move forward. It speaks to me about the lack of DEI in corporate America. Well, that's an interesting point that you make, uh, Carlos. But the reality is, uh, Professor uh, Jeffries is black folks are playing in this uh, animated reboot. So they were sitting around the table. They got the script. They read it They, you know, through their agents, their managers, and they signed on to the project. And then they actually tape, it appears that, you know, Netflix, they tape all the episodes or a great deal of them. So they knew what they were getting in and into. And I've seen several of those actors try to defend uh, this is just entertainment and work that's just pushing the boundaries. That's what the showrunner herself said. So I, I think, Carlos, you're going to be disappointed to know that Black folks are co-signing on this reboot. Well, you know, I'm always a little bit um, hesitant to lay blame for projects of poor taste um, on the actors themselves. Uh, as, as Carlos was pointing out, there's a lot of the steps before you get to a script uh, from concept to idea to implementation. So I think in those areas, uh, you got to have uh, Black folk around the table who are not. But well, wait a minute, Dr. Jeffries. I, I agree with you. But at some point, Black actors signed on to this project. Now, you can take the position that work is scarce and folks got to do what they have to do, but I don't think we can relieve them of some role that they are playing in making sure that this reboot goes forward. Because if all Black actors had said, I'm not going to you know, be a part of this racist, stereotypical you know, reboot, there wouldn't be any Black actors that are a part of it. No, I, I agree. I agree. I think my point is that I would, in my ideal world, it doesn't even get to the actors. Because uh, you know, actors are not historians. Actors are not social critics in that sense. Uh, it would be nice if it got past all of these levels and it got to the level of the actor and they were like, you know what, I'm not doing this. That would be great. 
I would applaud them, but I don't even think it should get to that point. Do I think, you know, the, 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 this, this set of actors, do I think that, you know, Steph Curry as an executive producer on this should have been like, hold up, wait a second. Yeah, but Steph Curry is also a basketball player. He's not somebody who sits and looks at these, who looks oh, at Oh, no, 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 Dr. Jeffries. We can't let Steph Curry, Steph Curry ain't the shut up and dribble guy. Steph Curry is sophisticated. He's uh, well-learned, learned. I, I know his mother and I know the kind of education that he has. We know he has access to the best historical, best historians in this country. So I'm oh. glad you brought up the fact that Steph Curry, I had forgotten about that, that he is a executive producer of this project. Well, then if, if, if he has that level of access, then those historians and those folk who are serving as his consultants did not do him right. Uh, you're right. If you're going to if you're going to engage in this type of art at this type of level, then you do need to surround yourself with people who can help you make the best make make one make make the best decisions in this instance. You know, I don't know what his level of involvement is in this, but I I, I do know this. Uh, if if you have those like I, I don't know if Dr. Hill was consulted on this, but I have a funny suspicion that he wasn't. Right. I mean, that's the caliber of people that you need to have involved. That's the caliber of people you need to have in these boardrooms who are thinking in this way so it doesn't have to get to this level. That's all I'm saying. There's lots of places where this could have been checked. This could have been stopped. Right now, it seems that we're at the level of the people saying, you know what? This has gone too far. This is not representative of us. This is playing in these old racist stereotypes. And just looking at the trailer, I haven't seen anything beyond that. I'm in total agreement. This is this is horrifying. Uh, but again, it could have been stopped at these different levels. And if we do DEI right, I don't even think it gets this far. But I think we have to accept responsibility as a community that the DEI conversation that the three of us have had on this show before, and I'm sure you're having with other colleagues, not everybody agrees with us. I mean, the black community is not monolithic and not everybody believes that, you know, it's a bad thing to have what well, it's just called a black exploitation type, you know, series like this. We went through this in the 70s, right? Dr. Hill, there was a ton of black exploitation movies where black actors were working. Uh, you know, we'd like to think you know better, you do better, but I don't know, maybe this is just one of those things where black folks see this differently. These actors, they are all very smart people. One of the main characters in this movie is Yvette uh, Brown. Yvette is a serious social justice warrior. I work with her on the campaign for Karen Bass for mayor in Los Angeles. So Yvette is, is, is not, you know, some shut up and dribble kind of an actress. She's a very, very socially conscious. So the fact that she was signed on to this project, maybe there's something about this we're missing. Ariva, that's the question that I'm in my head. How can this be so bad if all these people who we respect are a part of it? Um, but at the same time, uh, I think we know that we live in a world filled with images. And, and as Black people, we are not a monolithic and we think about things differently. This may, even though the social media as well as this move, change.org petition is very, this may be a case where Black people are like, no, these images, these representations don't define us anymore. And we're okay. We can be irreverent now. I don't believe so. Because Netflix is the most important platform movie wise that we have, even with Hollywood. This goal, these these films will circulate over and over. And if you if it may be fine for us to watch them, but not for everybody else. <laughs> okay. Yeah, and I just want, let's, let's name some names here. Steph Curry, uh, JB Smooth, Wanda Sykes is a part of this. Carl Jones is the co-creator. And his credits include Boondocks, Black Dynamite, and The Lost or The Last OG. Uh, so these, you know, this, this ain't no shabby group of people involved in this project. These are some veteran Hollywood folks, some newer folks to Hollywood, but this is a pretty all-star kind of cast. So you're right, Carlos. Maybe folks feel like, hey, you know, black folks can be depicted in all kinds of ways. We don't have to just do the Shirley movie, because I'm thinking Netflix is the same streaming uh, platform that just brought us Shirley with Regina King and her sister Raina King, educating us about, you know, Shirley Chisholm's first run for, or, you know, being the first black woman uh, to run for president. So you can watch Shirley on Netflix or you can watch on April 12th, 
the reboot of Good Times. Is that perhaps, uh, you know, Professor Hassan, what's happening here? Is that folks, uh, I'm sorry, Professor Jeffries, uh, where folks are saying, well, you know, black folks can be depicted in lots of ways. I don't think we, uh, one, there are not enough Shirley's being produced, uh, not just on Netflix, but across the board for us to be, as Dr. Hill pointed out, in a position uh, where we can say you, we can be as irreverent and play on these ra long, long held racist stereotypes, because the point has to be made and to underscore what, what Dr. Hill just said, this gets broadcast around the world, right? This gets picked up the images of, of how people around the world, including in Africa themselves, understand black folk, right? Is through media. And I guarantee you that the good times reboot and these racist stereotypes will travel much further uh, than Shirley or Rustin. And that to me is deeply problematic. And what's really problematic about this, we may, we could see through the stereotypes here in the community, if you will. But, you know, if you're, you know, on the continent, if you're in Europe, if you're in Asia, all you're getting is a, is a steady diet of, of racist stereotypes. And this feeds into that and reinforces it. And that to me is, it makes it doubly troubling. Yeah, uh, we're going to have to leave that conversation there. But when we come forward, we got to talk about abortion and Donald Trump and Mike Pence, I think about to have a uh, some kind of throwdown on this issue because Mike Pence says he has slapped the, his followers in the face based on his new stance on abortion. Stay with us. KBLA Talk 1580. More of a Reva Martin in real time when we come forward. forward. I'm Trey Thomas. Here's the latest on the Black Information Network. Washington University has suspended Kappa Sigma and Alpha Phi fraternities after an incident that involved students hurling eggs and racial slurs at a campus dining hall. The Black Student Association calls it a hate crime. A number of women at North Carolina State University say they are battling cancer due to a campus building. A study reveals that Pole Hall contains cancer-causing PCBs in its building materials. So far, 164 cases have been documented. California is having a tough time keeping black teachers in the classroom as a shortage of diverse educators takes center stage. That's the latest. I'm Trey Thomas on your home for 24-7 News, the Black Information Network and BINnews.com. Trouble back on the 10 East through Mid-City remains as an accident on the right shoulder just before Fairfax Avenue and Venice Boulevard split and heavy traffic continues up to 30 minutes from 20th Street. In Glendale's 134 East before San Fernando Road, accident remains on the right shoulder and a 15-minute backup still runs heavy from Bob Hope Drive. As you continue on to the 5 South, also in Glendale before Western Avenue, a stall is blocking the center lane and heavy traffic is coming from Burbank Boulevard. On the 405 North before Getty Center Drive and Sepulveda Pass, an accident is on the right shoulder with a 25-minute backup running heavy from National Boulevard. And in Costa Mesa, watch for a stop traffic over 15 minutes on the 55 North between the 405 and the 5. Californians face unique challenges that call for localized solutions. Strengthening the bonds of community in your neighborhoods is one of the best ways to be prepared for our next climate disaster. Neighbor to Neighbor is a California volunteers network designed to help strengthen your community. Learn more at caneighbors.com. This is the KBLA Sports Minute with Ray Richardson. The final game of the NCAA men's college basketball season is tonight in Phoenix. UConn takes on Purdue for the national championship. UConn is trying to become the first back-to-back -back national champion since Florida in 2007. Tip-off at 6.20 p.m. on TBS. The Lakers lost to Minnesota Sunday night, dropped them down to ninth place in the Western Conference standings with three games remaining. If the Lakers finish ninth, they will have to win two games in the playing round just to make the playoffs. 50 years ago today, April 8, 1974, Hank Aaron hit his 715th home run to pass Babe Ruth for Major League Baseball's all-time home run record. Aaron hit number 715 off Dodgers pitcher Al Downing in Atlanta. Aaron broke a record that has stood for 39 years. Although Barry Bonds is the current all-time leader with 755 homers, many people still consider Hank Aaron as baseball's all-time home run king. No debates, no speculation, just the info you need. That's your KBLA Sports Minute. I'm Ray Richardson on KBLA Talk 1580. Yeah, y'all, come on. Come the At KBLA Talk 1580, we fight the power every day. Yeah, 
give us what we want. Uh, Gotta give us what we need. I listen to KBLA, and I love the commercials. I know what the commercials mean. I also, if I'm looking and trying to figure something out, I need something to talk to me that might hit me. And it happens on TV, because, you know, every time they show a sporting event, they got the pharmaceutical companies back to back to back telling people how to fix the sickness on the same stuff that they sell them. So we get it. Yep, we get it too, Chuck D. And that's why at KBLA Talk 1580... We don't black down. Drop it. Our freedom of speech is freedom of death. We got to fight the power. Fight the power. Fight the power. Imagine with me here for a minute the most beautiful panoramic setting. Maybe it's an endless ocean, waves crashing on a beach, or a crystal clear mountain lake, peaceful and quiet. Or maybe it's just little kids playing in the park down the street. Wherever your imagination takes you, now imagine right smack in the middle of this perfect picture, a piece of litter. Just one piece right there in the middle of it all. Doesn't exactly fit, does it? In fact, even though it's just one piece, now it's all you can see. That one piece ruins everything. And that's the thing about litter. It doesn't take much to ruin everything. One thing's for sure, it simply does not belong anywhere in California. So here's the good news. If we work together, we will change it. We don't have to let litter, even just one piece, ruin your perfect picture. Not anymore, not ever again. Clean California, zero litter is the goal. Brought to you by Caltrans and CleanCA.com. You're listening to KBLA Talk 1580, where climate is king. Climate is king. KBLA Talk 1580. We've got a lot to talk about. Talk about. KBLA Talk 1580 believes in community empowerment. LA's 99 neighborhood councils form the grassroots level of the Los Angeles city government. The system was created to connect LA's diverse communities to City Hall. While neighborhood council board members are volunteers, they are also public officials elected to office by the members of their community. Neighborhood councils advocate on issues like homelessness, housing, land use, emergency preparedness, public safety, parks, transportation, and sustainability. They also provide local expertise on the delivery of city services to their various communities. Neighborhood councils are open to participation by anyone who is a part of the fabric of daily life in said community. This includes those who live, work, or own property, or a business. If you are interested in stepping up to join your local neighborhood council, visit www.empowerla.org. That's empowerla.org. It's time to think globally, but act locally. This is a community call to action from KBLA Talk 1580. We are back and Professor Hassan Jeffries as well as Professor Carlos Hill are both here helping me break down today's breaking and trending news. And in hour two, we're going to be talking about crime stats and the reality about you know what's happening with respect to crime around this country and how these crime stats are being weaponized by the Republican Party in particular to make it more difficult uh, to implement many of the criminal justice reform efforts that we saw put in place or put into play after George Floyd was murdered in May of 2020. All right, uh, Donald Trump, he has been all over the map on abortion and you can't believe anything he says anyhow, but today he came, just came out and said, you know what, let, let abortion be handled by the states. I, I'm not going to push for a federal ban. I don't really like these bans that uh, don't make exceptions for race and uh, rape and incest, but I'm gonna leave it up to the states. And boy, did uh, the anti-abortion people go after him, including his former VP, who said this was a slap in the face to all of those voters who so naively believed that he believed in their cause of anti-abortion. Are these people, uh, <laughs> Professor Jeffries, are, do they not, how many times must Donald Trump disappoint them or be proven to be lying to them. I don't know why everybody's shocked, surprised. He's gonna say whatever it takes to get elected. He may get, if he wins the election, he'll probably get in and say he wants a, a federal ban, who knows? He's just gonna say or do whatever is in his best interest. He clearly is not aligned with the Christian right and those anti-abortionists who Mike Pence pointed out, believed in him and supported him in 2016 and 2020. Well, I mean, you hit the nail on the head. 
Donald Trump is a person without principles um, and he will blow with the wind uh, on this issue. Uh, it was and, and the whole reason why Mike, Prent, Mike Pence was his vice president, vice presidential choice in the first place was to solidify uh, his bona fides with the uh, Christian conservatives who looked at him uh, and his anti-religious, you know, uh, uh, unprincipled ways and were like, oh, no, we can't do this. But he made a promise. He was like, I'll overturn Roe v. Wade. Uh, and so that brought him on board. They, they were willing to set aside everything else uh, to get that uh, that get that commitment. And he delivered on that right with the Supreme Court nominees. However, uh, it also became clear, as it was before, that this was not only uh, a little bit unpopular, it was grossly unpopular. Um, people believe on both sides of the across the political spectrum that women should have uh, reproductive freedom, reproductive choice. Uh, I, it, it is clear that uh, Donald Trump's um, uh, consultants are like, listen, this is a losing issue. Every time it's been on the ballot, Republicans have lost. And so he's trying to moderate. He's trying to meet trying to moderate his particular stance. Uh, as you point out, I wouldn't believe him one bit. Uh, certainly he is going to say that now. Uh, but if uh, Republicans control uh, Congress and put before him a bill on, a on that will that will ban uh, abortion and abortion access nationwide, he will sign it in a harpy. He will support it. He will issue an executive order uh, that reinforces comp the Comstock law, uh, which prohibits, you know, the, the old laws prohibiting um, the distribution of materials that can be used uh, for abortion. So I wouldn't. So, so, so Mike Pence, you can calm down. Right. Because your, your, your boy is not going to abandon you in that particular sense. The rest of us need to be worried and not fall for this smokescreen. Well, I think it, it, this is great for Democrats, uh, Carlos, because Mike Pence is pissed off, which, you know, first of all, like somebody smack Mike Pence, who does happen to be principled on these issues, but allowed himself to lay down with, you know, dog, a dog. And he got up with fleas. So, you know, here he is now on this crusade, acting as if there are so many new revelations about Donald Trump, like, oh my God, you know, he's a liar. I didn't know that. And he, he lied to us in 2016. He lied to us in 2020. So hopefully he'll be leading the crusade of the Christian right to say, don't vote for him because he can't be trusted on these issues. This abortion issue is a problem. It's a problem for Republicans up and down the ticket. And if those folks who have been lying about abortion in the way that Donald Trump has, if they now start to march in line with Donald Trump, they're going to face a huge problem with their base. The MAGA base uh, is not likely, at least the Christian part of that base, I mean, uh, anti-abortionists, that's one thing they will not compromise on. I mean, there are some things that these folks will not compromise on. And that is the issue of abortion. So uh, do you see this, Carlos, as a huge victory for the Democrats? It could be potentially. There were so many things leading into 2016 that we said would would uh, torpedo Donald Trump's candidacy. Uh, and it didn't um, because ultimately what he delivers is power for Republicans to do whatever they want to do with. Um, and so that is the consideration, not these particular issues, and le or at least in 2016, that's what drove them. We talked about it. That was their bottom line, getting it done. And everything else didn't matter. I think there is in 2024, a bottom line that Republicans have that we are not talking about. Because again, this is an existential election for us, but there's also things that the, Repu I don't call it the Republican party anymore because this that's not who they are, but we gotta say that because that's what they call themselves. Um, there are some bottom line things that they're not talking about that he will deliver. And unless we're talking about that, we're not really talking about, we're not- What really are some of those bottom line things you're alluding to? Well. Donald Trump talked about in his latest um, in his latest uh, fundraiser, lowering taxes, lowering the tax burden for the wealthiest people in America. That's the bottom line for a lot of people. It ain't abortion. Maybe it is for some voters. But for the people who are going to give him money and make sure that he's the next president, that might not be it.
So let's talk about that because this is the existential election. There are some things that are really at stake. Um, and I don't think this one for Donald Trump and or the people in power is the most thing, even though it might be costly for them at the election. You know, and I, I definitely agree that there are some other things at play that are important to Republicans or the party of Donald Trump other than abortion. But maybe I'm making too much of this, uh, you know, Professor Jeffries, but this could be like a real break because we, we know at some point men like Mike Pence, you know, we've seen it with John Kelly. We've seen it, you know, with uh, the former attorney general and others that I think these men do have a line, you know, that Donald Trump will cross and will cause them to, you know, just turn their backs on him. I think there, there is going to be a moment of reckoning. Donald Trump is not God. He's not invincible. He, you know, he, he puts his pants on the way the rest of us do. So we do know he is going to have to pay some consequences, face some consequences for his actions, for being the liar, the grifter, the con artist that he is. And, you know, it could be a, a quiet or silent or small revolution led by Mike Pence and the Christian right, just like they you know, propelled him into office, they could be the ones that take him down because they they kind of march to a different drum beat than I would say some of the others in the MAGA crowd. And many of these folks aren't the ultra wealthy. They're not the big corporate, you know, uh, CEOs or the big corporate shareholders that are going to benefit from these lower taxes. You only benefit from Donald Trump's, you know, tax breaks if you are in like the highest, you know, 5%, 1% income bracket in the United States. So we got to be clear about this. This tax breaks aren't hitting you if you're 50,000 or 60 or 70,000 dollar a year earner in the first place. So I don't know, maybe I'm being overly optimistic, but Mike Pence's wife, you know, who always hated Donald Trump, might be in his ear saying, "This is your time. You know, if you got any integrity, uh, you know, this is the issue that you go to war on." So we'll we'll see. It's hard to know with Donald Trump because he's so slippery as a candidate, but I do think this abortion issue, uh, just like it propelled him, could be the thing that you know uh, leads to his downfall. Uh, when we come forward, more of today's breaking and trending news right here on KBLA Talk 1580. You're listening to Ariva Martin in real time on KBLA Talk 1580. We asked seniors how to prevent Medicare scams. My best advice, if you get a phone call, do not talk to the person. These people are well-trained. Don't talk to them. They don't know me. They're just trying to scam me. Don't be fooled. Hang up. Just hang up. Never give out your Medicare number. They're going to get your number to put in a false claim. If I get a call from someone, I don't pick up the phone. And should I pick up the phone and ask for information, then I hang up. How do you detect Medicare fraud? Just like I check my credit card statements, I check my Medicare statements monthly. Scammers can get a hold of your number, order medical devices through your account, and you're not even going to know about it if you don't look at your statement. Check your statement every month. If you get your statement and you see something that you know you did not have done, you report it. Call your senior Medicare patrol. To report Medicare fraud, call the senior Medicare patrol at 855-613-7080. Did you know there is a health care system serving our community whose vision is health for a better world? What if I told you one of our nation's leading health care providers has a department dedicated to health equity and community engagement? Providence is Southern California's largest and most comprehensive healthcare network with 11 hospitals and 40 urgent care centers. Providence treats each patient with the compassionate care they deserve when and where they need it. Most importantly, Providence is a diverse family of people and organizations driven by the belief that health is a human right. Providence takes pride in forming community alliances that address health concerns that disproportionately impact those communities. For Minority Health Month, Providence is sponsoring Health for a Better World. Informative conversations with Providence health professionals on Urban Family Focus every Saturday in April at 7 a.m. Get to know more at Providence.org. I'm getting vaccinated with Prevnar 20, a Pfizer vaccine. 
So am I, because I'm at risk for pneumococcal pneumonia. If you're 19 or older with chronic conditions like asthma, diabetes, COPD, or heart disease, or are 65 or older, you are at increased risk for pneumococcal pneumonia. Ask your doctor or pharmacist about Prevnar 20, pneumococcal 20-valent conjugate vaccine. It can help protect you against pneumococcal pneumonia in just one dose. Even if you've already been vaccinated with other pneumonia vaccines, Prevnar 20 may help provide added protection. Prevnar 20 is approved for adults to help prevent infections from 20 strains of the bacteria that cause pneumococcal pneumonia. Continued approval may depend on a supportive study. Don't get Prevnar 20 if you've had a severe allergic reaction to the vaccine or its ingredients. Adults with weakened immune systems may have a lower response to the vaccine. Side effects include pain and swelling at the injection site, fatigue, headache, muscle, and joint pain. For full prescribing information, please call 1-855-213-2138. All right, Professor Jeffries, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris are making a big play for black and Latino voters, particularly those that have student loan debt. Uh, his announcement today of what he calls Plan B designed to really benefit black and Latinos uh, who have uh, disproportionately more student loan debt than their white counterparts. Uh, he's combining that program with the already $140 billion in student loan debt uh, that he's paid off or four bill of, uh, I guess it's about four million borrowers have benefited so far. Uh, is this the right thing to do? And do you think black students or folks who have student loan debt, black and Latinos, uh, see this as something positive since there's been so much negativity around uh, the initial efforts to relieve student loan debt? Well, I definitely think it's something positive. Uh, it's positive for individuals who are carrying or overburdened. Uh, with student loan debt. We, we, we know uh, certainly over the last 50 years, uh, the cost of higher education has just gone through the roof uh, and that burden has disproportionately fell uh, on lower income, working class, people of color who have, to, who, who have really had to shoulder uh, an extraordinary amount uh, to get the most uh, basic of college education, university education. Uh, and, and more importantly than that, uh, or equally important, it, it, it's good economically, right? I mean, it, it has been uh, predicted by, by many a folk that uh, if we thought the housing bubble crisis uh, was, was, was problematic back in 08, 09, uh, wait till the trillion dollar school debt, uh, college education debt bubble explodes. Uh, and so it, it, it makes good fiscal sense for the nation as a whole to begin to relieve some of this uh, excessive debt uh, that's just unnecessary. Uh, and, and, and in reality, that money that it then frees up uh, just gets funneled back either into savings or into the economy. Uh, will it have um, a, 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 a lasting or immediate impact in terms of voter support? I think it depends on how good they are at publicizing the reason for it and its far reach. Uh, certainly it may help those who get it, but even those who are not relieved, if they can see that this is a concerted effort coming from a genuine place of fiscal responsibility uh, and that he's he's following through, they're following through on a promise that they made, uh, then I think it will, uh, it will carry forward. It, it, it will have legs. But if as they are very good at not doing, not touting their own, tooting their own horn, right? Uh, you know, sometimes you get a win, you got to celebrate it and make sure that people know it uh, and not just, you know, just sort of casually go about your business. <laughs> now, that's nice. That, that That's cool. The humility is nice. Uh, but, we're, but you can't we're not dealing with humility when you're dealing with a narcissist. You have to publicize the gains and the wins that you're making so that people understand that you are actually doing following through on the promises. You know, it's so interesting you say that I was at a uh, hosting a panel at a conference in Baltimore on Friday. And there was a uh, member of the White House initiative on HBCUs who was sitting on the panel. And he said something that I thought was so simple yet so profound that I have not heard anyone talk about. He said he graduated from Morehouse 14 years ago. And he said 14 years ago, no one in the federal government was talking about relieving student loan debt. So he likes to remind students who are, you know, whining and complaining that, you know, Biden didn't do enough or hasn't fulfilled that promise that in actuality, he is the first president that has taken this issue on in a significant way and has already, as we know, relieved over, 
you know, 1.4 or $1.5 billion. And he said he could not have imagined when he graduated that he would be eligible to have his loans uh, wiped out. But yet as he sat there, he was the beneficiary of, uh, you know, one of these programs. And I just was talking to someone else today who said they know someone who was so strapped with debt they couldn't buy a home, they couldn't make investments, and they had their student loans paid off and immediately they were able to buy a home. Uh, so Carlos, there are a lot of good stories like that. I mean, particularly this Morehouse, uh, you know, this graduate who said, look, it may not be perfect, but 14 years ago, I had no sense that I could get my loans paid off. Uh, how do we get that message? You're on a college campus. Uh, how do that message gets gets? How do we get it to dis, you know disseminate it broadly to those students who uh, likely may be like these two guys I'm talking about who may have their debt paid off and may be able to buy a home or to make some other kind of investment? I mean, I think it's what my dear brother uh, Professor Jeffries says: when you have victories, you need to celebrate them. When you have great ideas, you need to celebrate them. The great idea here is student loan debt is a national political issue made for the Democrats, right? Just in the same way that tax cuts are an issue for Republicans that Donald Trump can go to any fundraiser across this country and say, I got tax cuts for you. You ready for that? And everybody gets excited. Student loan debt is the same thing for poor and working people, right? or just for people who are strapped with debt that they can't pay for, mm -hmm. it's the same thing. Because as Dr. Uh, Jeffrey says, as soon as people get from under that debt, they put that money back into the economy. So it only helps us, not just those people, right? And so make it a national political issue that people understand. When you talk about cutting student debt, that means the economic the economy rises make that a political issue that's the opportunity no you're absolutely right like i said this this guy on this panel just you know kind of resonated with me the thought that even there would be an opportunity to have your loan debt relieved i don't hear you know democrats owning that like yeah it may not be perfect but look it's a four million people who've already benefited 1.5 billion dollars and again 10 years ago this wasn't even a thought and it definitely is not, as you said, the Republicans issue. It is a Democrat issue, a Democrats issue, and one we should be embracing and touting and spreading the word as much as we possibly can. Before I let you both go, got to talk about this win uh, for Don Staley. Uh, so impressive. I mean, just listening to some of her comments after the game, uh, South Carolina's defeating Iowa, and just her desire. Literally, I heard her say in an interview that she wants to help these uh, women players you know, who are playing basketball, earn enough money to address the issue of generational wealth. That's a pretty bold statement, not one that you likely, or that you typically hear from a coach, uh, Professor Jeffries. How is Dawn Staley changing the game? Well, she's definitely changing the game. And, and if I may take a, a, just a, a 10 seconds of personal privilege, I'm, I'm a girl dad with three girls, Asha, Aliana, and Alayla, 13, 10, and 8. And we're down in Columbus, Ohio. And we made the trip up both for the final four. And so we were we were sitting not quite court side, but we weren't that far away as we were enjoying uh, the final four. And, 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 and it was impressive. We were pulling for South Carolina, but we appreciated Clay, Caitlin Clark. But as you said, in the end, Dawn Staley. You know, she wasn't you know, there was a spotlight on her and she commanded it. But 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 she took the time in that spotlight to to raise these critical issues. And she had been doing that all along. This isn't just a one off thing. Right. I mean, mm -hmm. she's thinking about transgender athletes. She's thinking about her athletes and young women and gender equity, intergenerational, multigenerational wealth. I mean, it's just fantastic. I'm, I'm glad that she got the win. I'm glad that women's basketball and women's sports was highlighted in this particular way. It was a great weekend. It's been a great year. I look forward to that momentum continuing. Yeah, I mean, the, the women's basketball was, uh, for ESPN, you know, more watched, uh, the, the most watched, I should say, uh, game ever, including the men's game. And a lot of folks are saying the men's game, uh, Dr. Hill, was boring. <laughs> you know, all the action was with the women. Now we know there's a long way to go because the men go to, you know, professional leagues and make millions and millions of dollars, even if they just sit on the bench, whereas the star women often have to go to other countries in order to earn 
sometimes one tenth of what the men make. But uh, maybe this is a change. Maybe this is a you know a, a turning point for women's basketball. I hope it is. But can I speak on Don Staley? What I think she's a true champion in the sense of the word. I mean they. They were the dominant team all year. They finished the season undefeated. This is excellence. I might even say black excellence. I might not get in trouble. But this is excellence. But I would say more than that, she's a champion on the court, but she's a champion off the court. She's a true champion. She's a champion for women athletes, not just basketball. She took her moment to highlight Caitlin Clark and her greatness. What about your greatness? She took it to highlight someone else's greatness in the interest of the sport. She's a true champion, and we got to give it up for her. Yes, no, Queen Dawn. That's what she's being called all over the internet, and she earned that title, uh, you know, just representing, I'll say it, Black Girl Magic and Black Excellence. There it is. On that note, I have to say we are out of time. Thank you, both of you, for joining me. Always a pleasure to be in conversation with you. Make sure you stick around for our We're going to be talking about those crime stats and what they really mean. Stay with us, KBLA Talk 1580. Thank you. Appreciate you both. Always, always, always. Absolutely. Thanks so much for having me. Take care.